Goedemorgen allemaal. Dankjewel voor de aankondiging. Zoals je hebt gehoord, ik heb een aantal jaar nu al in Amsterdam gewoond. Maar het is, wat ik wil vanochtend met jullie communiceren is heel persoonlijk. En dat is onmogelijk in Nederlands. Zou ik lief, mag ik dat doen in Engels? Ik kan het wel doen in Nederlands, want de kans dat je al in slaap valt is heel groot. <laughs> so I'm going to carry on in English. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to take you on a, a bit of a, an odd journey. And um, it's the intention behind it. You're talking earlier about sort of friendship and values. This is about an extraordinary value, um, but the only way I've really been able to discover it is by generating a phenomenal friendship. And it's the way with which I've managed to communicate that with the people that I've met. So I'm going to take you on a journey. Um, we're going to begin with this picture. This is a symbolic picture. I take pictures, but I don't necessarily regard myself as a photographer. Because nowadays, the whole world takes pictures. It's statistically managed that two and a half billion pictures have been uploaded online every day at the moment. I mean, my children attach GoPros to the head of our pets, so our dogs run around the house making films. So being a photographer is not particularly significant, but it's very significant to the fact, and very exciting to the fact, that we're all making pictures all day of one another, and most importantly, of ourselves. How do we see each other? So I'm going to begin with a picture of me. This is a selfie. Uh, I'm not, it's not about vanity, but it's about a particular moment I wanted to record where everything had gone wrong. Um, it looks as if I'm happy and I've got my sort of hood on, but every adjective that you could ever imagine is happening at this moment. This is about four years ago, and it's dramatic. Uh, first of all, I'm extremely cold, minus 40 degrees centigrade. Uh, I'm lost, I'm disorientated, I'm homesick, uh, I'm verging on depression. Because I've tried to do something and I've failed. I've completely and utterly failed. In English, I don't know how you'd say that in Dutch. I've bitten off more than I could chew. I sort of went off on this journey and I wanted to naively, idealistically document uh, these people. These are called the Satan in northern Mongolia. But I didn't want to make reportage pictures of them. I wanted to put them on a pedestal. I wanted to make them iconic. I wanted to uh, document them with a message. But I'd failed because I couldn't communicate with them. And Two weeks before getting to them, I'd arrived at the bottom of the valley of the mountain range, and the one thing that's always important is you need a translator. So I sort of ran into the local sort of uh, uh, village, and I met you, and we were sitting in a bar, and you spoke quite passable English, and I said, I need to go to the Satan. And you said, yeah, yeah, I know where the Satan are. And I said, what will it cost me? And we sort of came to a deal, and we drank a few vodkas, and off we went. So we sort of started walking. We walked for two weeks up this valley together. We became friends, we got to know each other very well, and the day we arrived there, and there they were, and it was very exciting. If you spent two weeks walking through my minus 40 degrees centigrade in a mountain range in northern Mongolia, and there they were, and I looked at you, and I said, it's ready, come on, let's, let, let's start. And you sort of looked at me and went a bit sort of wise. You said, well, there's a problem. And I said, well, what's the problem? He said, yeah, I don't know this dialect. I said, what? You know, we spent two weeks building up to this day and you don't know this dialect? He said, yeah, but you didn't tell me we would be in this valley. We're in the wrong valley. And I said, oh, Jesus, you know, what do you mean the wrong valley? And I said, but why? You knew where we were going. And he said, yeah, but why didn't you tell me? And he said, yeah, well, I needed your money. So there I am in the middle of northern Mongolia with a group of people I need to communicate with, and I have no translator. So I'm stuck. So I relaxed. I was sort of a little bit angry with you, but I didn't want to show it. And I thought, alles kom goed. It took two more weeks. In those next two weeks, I didn't make one picture. I didn't make one film. I didn't communicate one word. It was impossible. There was this wall, and the wall grew wider and wider and wider and wider until that day of the selfie, until that day where I realized it's the day to turn around. It's the day to sort of put the tail between my legs and go home with nothing. So on the last night before I was sort of about to pack my bags and walk down with my happy translator back down into the village, we were every evening, th these are reindeer herders. And every evening, about 40 of them. How many people are there here today? 100, 120? If you imagine about half of this room, we would all crawl into a teepee together. And at night, it's cold, it's dark, it's windy, it's like minus 40. And the only way to keep warm, keep warm in the teepee is you literally sit on top of each other. And you put your arms and your legs in each other's elbows and groins, and you become this sort of human sardine. And every night, they would get out a bottle and pass it around the tent. And prior to that, I was you know, on my professional journey to make these iconographic pictures. But I'd failed. So I thought, well, I'll have a sip of the bottle. So they gave me the bottle, and, uh, and it was amazing. It was a sort of homemade jet fuel, a little bit like sort of vodka. <laughs> and I had one sip, and I remember very, very clearly, and the only way I can describe it, it's very childish, is have you ever jumped into cold water in a wetsuit and had a pee? 
<laughs> that sort of feeling where it sort of slowly trickles down and you sort of indulge in that sort of moment of, and that's what it felt. And it was extraordinary. I think for the first time in two weeks, I sort of felt happy. So happy, in fact, I had another sip. And in a very short period of time, I'd finished the whole bottle. Um, the consequences were I became drunk, very drunk, but I didn't feel guilty because I think the whole tent was drunk. So we sort of fell into this self-induced sort of alcoholic coma in a tent. So half of this room, everybody lying on top of each other, drunk as a skunk, the wind's blowing, it's dark, it's cold, but without a worry in the world. Until middle of the night, there's a technical problem. And it's not a very complicated technical problem. I needed to go to the loo. And so I sat up and the tent started spinning the wrong way. And I thought, oh, you know, if I stand up now, this is going to be a disaster. I'm going to fall on somebody. I've got to get out of this. So I thought, well, you know, as is often the case when one is drunk, uh, one is much smarter than one really thinks they are. So I thought, well, I'll become a crab and I'll roll over these bodies. I won't wake anybody up because I can't wake them up. And I'll get to the sun. I'll just, I won't even have to go outside. I'll just lean outside and have a pee. And so I got to the side of the tent, very proud, looked back. Everybody's fast asleep lifted up the side of the tent, but made technical mistake number one. I took off my glove, lifted up the side of the tent, my hand stuck to the side of the tent because I'd forgotten it's minus 40 degrees centigrade. So you're drunk, it's the middle of the night, the wind's howling, you've got one hand attached to a tent, 40 sleeping satan tucked behind, and you desperately need the loo. And then I looked down with my other hand and I thought, oh no, there are 40 layers of beaver sport clothing tucking in my genitalia. How on earth am I going to get there in time? So I sort of flailing around, and the inevitable happened. I didn't make it on time. And a disaster, uh, empty bowels all over the tent, all over me. I sort of lay there in sort of despair. Turn around, everybody's still drunk. Everybody's still fast asleep. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. So I sort of rolled back. The secret's mine. Fell back into sleep. Until a few minutes later, um, a serious disaster happened. We need another picture. Okay. To illustrate the serious disaster. Yeah, there we go. They're reindeer herders. Uh, these reindeer decided to stamp or eat over the tent. Two o'clock in the morning, 40 drunk people standing up, no tent over our heads. Everybody stands up screaming. The tent blows up the hill, and 40 of these, 50 of these reindeer start walking around. And one after another, they start to walk towards me. Now, it's a sort of very strange situation. You're drunk, you're wet, you've peed on yourself, everybody's screaming, there's no tent, and 40 reindeer start to sort of gather and look at me. Not only that, they have antlers on. You can see they have antlers. And they decided, for one strange reason or other, to start trying to lick me from head to toe. So I'm sort of walking backwards up a hill. Behind me, little did I know, there's a cliff. So I'm sort of going backwards. It felt a little bit like sort of Monty Python on steroids. Everything you could ever imagine is going wrong. And then I began to say, I'm in, tro I'm in problems here. This is not actually funny anymore. So I started to scream. I screamed at the top of my voice. And I was crying with desperation. Save me, because I'm about to be licked and pushed over this cliff. Slowly the satan saw me in the distance through the mist. And they didn't do anything. They just looked at me, pointed at me, put their hands on their hips, bent over and started laughing. So the more they laughed, the more I screamed, the more I cried. And then eventually, the man on the left-hand side here uh, came through. Where are we? Oh, we go back. The man on the left-hand side came through and came up to me. And he said, um, what are you doing? And I said, what am I doing? This man here, what am I doing? What's your reindeer doing? They're about to leave. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. And he looked at me and he said, you know, but it's your fault raising his hands with that. And I said, well, you know, what do you mean? He said, he pointed at my groin. He said, you peed yourself. And I denied it. I, I didn't pee myself at all. I had nothing to do with it. He said, well, of course you did. And he turned around, showed me his backside. And on his backside, and all the Saturn turned around at the same. They showed me this leather pouch attached to them. And he took it off and he put it under my nose and it smelt of urine. And I was sort of a bit, you know, well, what's this all about? And he said, well, we pee in there. And we use the urine, and as you'd imagine, over the last few weeks, you've watched the reindeer follow us over the mountains. We spread our urine, and they follow and they use the urine because there's salt in there. And because 12 months of the year it's snow and ice here, this is how we gather the reindeer behind us. And I said, yeah, but why didn't you tell me that in the first place? And he said, yeah, but you didn't tell us you'd pee your pants. <laughs> so this whole, so anyway, the, the, we went back down into the tent. Everybody's still laughing at me. All the people, all the kids coming up, pointing at me, giggling, all the old ladies with their hidden bottles, offering me more alcohol. We crawled back into the tent. I became the sort of the clown. I became the sort of the, the, the Mr. Bean of the journey. So I sort of sat there, sort of, you know, very sort of sheepish, still a bit wet, everybody laughing. 
but something magical happened. It was very, very beautiful. A sort of a friendship began, a very different friendship, a friendship of vulnerability, of fallibility, of having brutally failed, becoming this very sort of vulnerable child, miles away from home and desperate. A sort of very, very humble childish contact was developed. And slowly, 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 I started to be able to make the pictures which I'd set out for. I eventually ended up spending another three weeks with them, traveling with them, with a very de basic, but a very simple, but very humble relationship, all based on actually failing. Um, why am I in Mongolia in the first place? And we were talking about it a few minutes ago. What took you on this journey? Well, this goes back a long, 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 long time. This is me. Uh, it's very personal, this, but it's very significant. Um, seven years old, uh, father worked for Shell. He sent me off to Kosko. I became very independent, uh, Jesuit Catholic school somewhere in northern England. And at the age of 16, um, I remember traveling back from Sierra Leone uh, somewhat ill. I had cerebral malaria. Cerebral malaria is not the best thing to suffer from. And uh, oh, it went on a bit early. I uh, got back to the school ill. The priest said, um, everything's fine. If you take these pills, you'll wake up in the morning and everything will be better. And instead, I woke up in the morning. I ended up looking like this. My hair fell out in 24 hours. Now, uh, as I stand here today at the age of 47, my kids mock me at length. Yeah, but dad, you're just old. You know, that story about having no hair is irrelevant. I said, it is now. But when you're 16 and you wake up one morning and you look in the mirror, your whole life changes. Now, I've got teenagers. And you know, their, their life is changing on a 24-hour day basis moment. They're not suffering from anything. It's a very wild moment of confrontation. Your identity completely changes. This is 1984, the UK. We, as a culture, everybody judged each other, let alone ending up waking lo looking like this one morning. So I was a little bit sort of disorientated, so disorientated that I decided to run away at the age of 17. I packed my bags, it shouldn't be carrying on, and I took myself off to Tibet. I ended up walking the length of Tibet uh, for a period of a year. Uh, to dress, I dressed up as a monk and wanted to find a contact, a contact with uh, people who looked like me. Uh, I wanted to find an empathy. On that journey, I took a camera. I came back at the age of 18. A few pictures were published. And that took me on this journey of discovery, of looking at myself and looking at other people. So about... Uh, here we go, and it was inspired by this great intellectual, Tintin, in Dutch you said Kaufje. Most, more importantly, I think in life you all need a sort of an inspiration. This is somebody for me who's very, very significant. I remember as a child after I came back from that journey and I started looking at pictures and analyzing who we were and how we looked at each other, how we documented each other. This gentleman, his name is Edward Sheriff Curtis. Now he, 150 years ago, spent 30 years documenting the Native American Indian. He put them on a pedestal, he raised them high, he made them into icons, and he said, look at these people, look at what they stand for, look at their values. At the time, though, he was mocked. When he died, he was bankrupt. The majority of his pictures were destroyed, as well as the Native American Indian themselves. What I'm perhaps now trying to do uh, today is emulate him, be inspired by him, but look at the rest of the world and say there are still these native cultures around the world. They are very important, they're very significant, but the only way we can understand that is by presenting them in an iconographic way. So I made a book about one and a half years ago, here we go, and something very, very interesting happened. I didn't really understand what I was doing. It was a real gut instinct, it was a feeling, I have to make these pictures, I have to share them. Why, how, who, and what, I'm not really sure. And something extraordinary happened. In a very short period of time, I think more than seven and a half thousand publications around the world started to publish them with the wonders of the internet. And then it got even more exciting. After the publication, every form of media outlet you could ever imagine came to me and they said, Jimmy, 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 these pictures, who are you? And I said, once again, looking at them, I have no idea. Who are these people? Who are you to tell us these people are important? So much so, they went even further and said, you're actually a fake. These people don't exist. They don't look like that. This is of no value and no significance to us at all. Then it went even further. In a very short period of time, I have a couple of young employees. They set up a Facebook page. We had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of followers. Then one day, we woke up one morning, and we'd been taken off Facebook because I was accused of tribal pornography. Um, this was re 
<laughs> instigated all of that. And that went even further. I was attacked by world organizations. You can see at the top here, Jimmy Nelson's wrong-headed obsession <laughs> with vanishing indigenous peoples. Now, this is perhaps where I want to take it. Um, Wrong-headed it is not, but obsession it is. It is an obsession to share, it is an obsession to show, and to communicate with you who these people are and what they stand for, for me and hopefully to you. So I'm going to share a few stories of these journeys. But to begin with, I need somebody from the audience to help me. Um, Mark, if you can come and stand up here. One of the simplest questions I'm often asked, and other than peeing in your pants in a tent, you get, here I am, I'm in a, a country where these men are essentially cannibals. How on earth do you make these pictures? 99% of the times I fail in my finding of a translator. I'm very inadequate with languages, as you just heard with my Dutch. So how on earth do you make these pictures? Well, it's extremely important. It's how we look and how we see one another. And that can be done without words. So you arrive in, an, uh, in a village like this, and it's extremely important within seconds, you make yourself as small and as humble and as vulnerable, and Dutch you say, kretsbaar as possible, and you literally put yourself on the floor like a dog. These people are cannibals. They want to indirectly eat me. So within seconds, they're kicking, they're punching, they're shouting, sometimes they're slamming, and you basically have to say, you're the boss, you're the boss, you're the boss. I am no threat whatsoever. There's not a camera in sight, there's nothing in sight, and you sit on the floor. And this whole process can sometimes take days. Days and days and days. You sit on the floor of the village, and you just sit there, and you just sit there. And then slowly what happens, everybody gets bored, and they stop kicking, and they stop throwing, and they walk away. And then invariably there's one man left over, and he's a little bit more curious. And today it's going to be you, Mark. And you're still standing there, and I'm still sitting here, but slowly we start to look at one another. And slowly I sidle up to you, and you're not threatened anymore, because I'm still small, and you're towering over me, and you're dribbling with your spears. And then but eventually I come up to you, and I sort of touch your arm, and I say, wow. You're amazing. And I start to worship you. And then it doesn't matter what language you use. If you touch somebody and go, oh, wow, you're extraordinary. And say, wait, 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 wait there, wait there, wait there. You're amazing. Don't move, don't. And I start opening this box. And in this box, I've got these very old plate film cameras. They're not digital cameras. There's nothing about speed. It's about 50 years old with these old sheets. And then I start building it and I put it on a tripod and I start looking at you and I start coming backwards. And slowly I get closer and closer. And if you sit like, you've got to sit up straight. That's amazing. Sit down. I'm going to look. I start looking through the glass and focusing. It gets hotter. I get more stressed. I get more vulnerable. I get more emotional. Getting backwards and forwards. And then, wait, wait, if you raise your chin, amazing. Lift your chin. Look up there. Super. Man. Breathe through your nose. Breathe through your nose. And then eventually we have a sort of, we have a sort of, it's almost a seance. This whole process, you see, I'm worshipping you. I'm getting more and more excited because this will be the most extraordinary picture. And then you realize, you look around, there's not enough light. There's no studio. I've got no assistance. I need some light on you. So I need other people. So quick, quick, quick. So eventually the rest of the village starts coming back. They start getting curious. What's happening here? And I go here and I stand here and I say, okay, I'm going to give you a big reflector and you stand here and you open your arms. You see the sun up there. You've got to shine the sun on his face there. Okay, but then I need somebody else. And you hear that. You sit down there, but you see the shadows under here. You need to shine a reflector up there. That's it, like that. Another. I need you over here, and you come, 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 quick, 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 before the sun goes. You get down, no, 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 and then go, go reflect up there. You see up there, and then eventually, before you know it, you've got 40 people surrounding you with this human studio. But the problem is the sun is moving, so you're running around in circles trying to catch the sun to get the river. And the whole time you're getting glory. You're getting more strong, you're getting more powerful, because the whole village is worshipping you with this crazy ball guy going behind the stativ, sweating like a dog trying to make these pictures of you. And then eventually you think, I need, I need five seconds to take the picture. Um, go on to another picture, we could pass this film. I need five seconds to take the picture, so shh because the light is so low. So I put the sheet and we count to five. One, two, three, four, five. But if you stay still and everything works, it's amazing, the picture's extreme. Yeah, it's again. And we start moving each other. And the whole village is jumping around because something magical has happened. They don't know what has happened, but it's a process of worship. And then you start coming up like this, and you push him out of the way, and you sit here. My turn. Yeah, come on. I'm strong. Look like this. And then this whole process happens, and the whole village wants to sit in that chair. The whole village wants to go through this process of worship. And then after the day, you're exhausted, and you think, that's enough. You wake up in the morning, and somebody comes to the little house you're sleeping in, and they, say, they point, and there's a whole another village from another valley all lining up, because they've heard somebody's come to see them. Somebody's come to put them on a chair. Somebody's come to say they're beautiful. Somebody's come to say they're strong. And this goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then that's how you, you become a sort of friend in a way, this sort of obscure bit. But they don't know what I'm doing. They don't understand what photography is. I'm not paying them, but they do see I'm there to see them. 
And then it gets exciting. Think, wow, wouldn't it be amazing after all these portraits if I take them into the environment? So I found this waterfall. It's a two-day walk away from the village. So they follow me, and we go off into the, into, the, into the landscape, and then we make this sort of iconographic. Thank you. You can all sit down. Thank you. You did a very good job. And then the idea behind a picture like this, this is, you know, for me, the equivalent of Avatar. I mean, that film, I'm sure some of you have kids. I mean, I saw it umpteen times. It made $3 billion in the American box office. No ever film has made more money. But it's essentially this. It's about a group of people that are in complete touch with themselves, in complete touch with their bodies, their traditions, their culture, and the nature that they live in. And these people still do exist today. And that's the idea behind this kind of picture. And then this man here uh, always reminds me of uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. Do you ever see that Robin Williams somewhere? Yeah. Take a deep breath. Okay, we got. This is an amazing story. The further you go, the more extreme the experience. This is Chukotka. Uh, does anybody know where Chukotka is? Chukotka is Siberia, but it's not only Siberia, it's the furthest reaches of Siberia. It's a 13 hour flight from Moscow. That's if you land there safely. As you can see, some people kind of miss the runway. And I had this idea, I wanted to go and visit the last Eskimo. Now, in the whole of the Northern Hemisphere, there are hundreds of thousands of Inuits, but none of them who look like I'd fantasized as a child. None of them dressed in fur with horns, but they do still live here in Chukotka. So I sort of spent about four years actually online. I'd found somebody in a town in that vicinity, and I said, you spoke good English. And I said, can I come? Can I come? He said, yeah, I'll take you to the Chukchi. It'll be amazing. I said, four years later, I arrived at the airport, and there he was. And uh, I said, OK, you know, I've got two weeks, and uh, let's go and find them. And he says, yeah, there's a slight technical problem. And there wasn't a technical problem about communication this time. It was about, he said, well, Chukotka is a big place. And I said, yeah, I know, I know. And he said, it's as big as France. So that's OK. And I said, but there are only 40 Chukchi split into two groups. OK. And he said, they're nomads. They move. I said, but you knew I was coming. We could have you know, spent four years planning this process. And he goes, yeah, but I can't get, they don't have telephones. I said, so what are you telling me? He says, well, if you come with me in my brother's tank, we can take two months of diesel on the roof. We go off into the tundra and the ice, but I can't guarantee when we'll find them or if we'll find them at all. This is a very strange situation to be in. He says, but you can trust me. You just have to let go and we go on this process if you really want to meet the Chuchi. So as you can see, I sort of kind of let go, jumped into this tank, and we went off on a journey. The journey took uh, 31 days. Um, again, I was a bit miffed, you know, how are we going to find the Chukchi? And he said, oh, that's very, very easy. We're going to follow the reindeer droppings. And I got a bit sort of awkward when I heard about reindeer again, and he didn't quite understand you know, my history. He goes, it's very easy. By the age and the distribution of the droppings, we'll be able to follow them over the ice. But again, I don't know how long it'll take to get there. So we sort of jumped in the tank and off we went on this journey. This is Abram, the cameraman I took with me. This is how we'd wake up every morning. The outside came in. It was only minus 20 inside. And then after 30 days of sitting in this tank, we sort of came over this mountain range and we'd sort of kind of lost the plot at this stage. Uh, but we saw something in the distance, something magnificent in the distance. And we saw this. It was like arriving in Manhattan for the first time. We saw a tent. And that was kind of exciting. I was kind of excited about this process. I jumped out of the tank, and then we saw a few of the Chukchi sitting around. And you have no idea if you've spent half your lifetime fantasizing about getting to a place like this. And you see a man looking like this, and he's sitting there. And he's just sort of iconographic figure. So I leapt out of the tank, and I was, oh, you're amazing, handsome, five seconds, stand here, reflecting, you know, overly excited. I've been in this tank for a month. You know. And he said, looked at me and the whole village looked at me and they looked at me and they looked further and he raised a finger and then he looked at me and he waved the finger from side to side and he goes Nyet. now I don't speak Russian but I understood very clearly what he meant and he basically said there is no pictures and no film I said what you know after the whole of this journey but he said we would like you to stay we would like you to stay and watch us we'd like you to stay and observe us and we don't have time to sit still for photography because it's cold and we're surviving so having traveled to the end of the world I ended up in a situation which was extremely profound because it went beyond taking a picture, beyond filming. I wasn't allowed to. I had to observe them. I had to participate in them. I had to see their ritual. I had to see how they lived and see how they survived, which I didn't normally do on these journeys. And then at, at, at the end, significantly, they said, OK, in two days we had to go back. And they said, OK, you can start taking a few pictures now. And then they shared a story with me. And I, this blew my mind. I said, 
why are you here? And they were obviously quite intelligent and we had a good translator. And it turned out they'd chosen to be there and I didn't understand. And they said, well, a few years ago they lived here. Prior to that, they lived in the tundra and the Russian authorities came to them and said, yeah, you know, um, it's, you know, time has moved on and ethnic culture is not necessarily needed. We're going to subsidize you. We're very proud of you. We're going to move you to these block of flats. So they moved here. They didn't know any different. And after about six months, somebody from the, uh, the authorities came to them with a big clipboard and he looked at them and he says, yeah, you don't look like the same people who arrived here. And the, the Chukchi chief said, I don't understand. And he said, well, you look unhappy. And the Chukchi chief said, well, what is unhappy? We don't have this word in our language. And then they discussed it and analyzed it. And he said, well, it's a new word for us, but you must be right. We have become unhappy because we don't do anything. We sit around all day, we drink all day, we have no participation with our elders, nothing to do with the children, we have no function, we have no purpose, we have no identity. And in a very short period of time, he turned around and he said to the Chukchi, we're going back. And this was three years after we met them on the ice. And now, when you're traveling back in the tank and sort of thinking about this lesson, I thought it's incredible. I come back here, this is my life here, I wear my jeans, I live in Amsterdam, and I'm often moaning, I'm often complaining, I can't do this, I can't do that, it's a clem here, they can't eat. What a load of, excuse my French, crap. When you are in a position where you completely feel, when you are completely in touch and 100% in balance, as are the Chukchis who have chosen to uh, be, have and live the existence that they do. You have no idea. They really feel. They feel themselves. They feel the temperature. They feel their existence. They feel their essence of being. And they chose to leave those flats and go back into the ice and live in a tent. Because there they said we had purpose. This made us happy. Even though we only lived on a 24 hour day basis, this was a choice we made. And they made me sort of begin to reflect, you know, we, if we are in touch, if we truly remove the concrete from underneath our feet, which we've built everywhere, we can make fantastic choices. We are 100% in control, but often we're so far removed from who we really are. And then this last story of these journeys, before I conclude, is probably the sort of the uh, antithesis of this whole um, experience, but it wasn't necessarily intended. This is, um, if any of you enjoy traveling and not necessarily photography, and you want to experience nature in an environment and a culture, this is where you have to go. This is the Altai Mountain in northwestern Mongolia. It's truly spectacular. And there live these people. Again, there are only about 80 of them. They're the Kazakh. Now, the Kazakh as a nation, there are many millions, but the Kazakh eagle hunter, there's only 80 of them. And as with all these cultures, you know, this is one, they have rituals. When a child is becoming a man, they send their children up a cliff. And these children have to scale a cliff and get a baby eagle. And my kids are just moaning about getting a pet dog for crying out loud. And they get that baby eagle. And when they capture it, they train it. And they live for the rest of their life with this eagle. And this eagle hunts. This eagle is 30 kilos. It has a five meter wingspan. And they spend the whole of the winter months traveling across these fantastic mountain ranges, hunting foxes and rabbits. And it's a truly spectacular and warm culture. Um, went through the whole process, portraits, making contact, and then towards the end, I was desperate to get them to the waterfall, in this case, up into the mountains. And I said, please, 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 come with me. That meant getting up at two o'clock in the morning, because I wanted to get the morning light. It had to have the contrast, it had to have the beauty of the landscape. So they came, and the first morning we crawled up the mountain. Three hours later, we're standing in there, and it's cold, and it's windy, and the, the horses are not standing still, and the eagles are turning around the wrong way, and it's manic, and it's desperate, and, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, but there's no sunrise, and it's dark, and it's gray, and it's flat. And I'm thinking, this isn't the picture I wanted to make. This isn't what I saw before I came here. So I said, we're not going to make the picture. And we walk down, and they look a bit confused, and they started shaking their head as if to say, we're not doing this again. And I said, oh, please, tomorrow morning, can we do it again, please? Because tomorrow morning the sun will come, and then I'll get my picture. They sort of looked at me reluctantly, and the next morning I dragged them out of bed. We stood up there. We're standing there. Again, there's no sun. And you have this sort of moment of, you know, am I going to be this sort of autistic perfectionist and say no, or am I just going to get out my digital camera and paste it in the sky later in Photoshop? And I said, I'm going to choose for option one. We're not going to make the picture. So we walked down, and they literally said again, no way will we coming up with you again tomorrow morning. So I sort of cried most of the day. The next morning, I dragged them up. 
third morning, last morning, we're standing there, and it began to happen. The sky began to clear, the sun began to rise. So I was excited, but I was exhausted. They're standing behind this tripod, and they're there, and everything's in line. It's looking spectacular, and I look through the camera, and it's got the wrong lens, because the lenses are attached to this metal plate, and I've got to take it off, and it's so quickly, stupidly, I took my gloves off, started to fiddle with the lens, and I stuck to the plate of the lens, because it's minus, minus 20 degrees. So you're standing there exhausted with your fingers attached to a camera which you can't remove. So they're looking at you thinking, you know, come on, it's time to make the picture. And I'm saying, I can't, I'm stuck to this camera. And then you say, well, I've got to remove myself from the camera. So I sort of took my fingers off, left all the skin behind. They started to bleed. It's as if somebody's hitting you with a hammer. And I remember sitting down and on, the, on a rock and I started to sob. Uh, I was exhausted. I'd again failed. I'd pushed the boundaries too far and I wasn't going to get the picture, the picture I dreamed of making. I was sitting there on this rock sobbing with not so much pain but exhaustion. And one of the Cossacks sort of gestured and he said, look behind you, look behind you. And I said, look behind me. And two of the women had followed us up from the village. Not this one, she was a bit younger, but two of these big, handsome, strong Mongolian women with these big fur hats and coats and they sort of waddled up to me. I said, well, I said, I can't do anything, my fingers are hurting, you know, I'm crying like this. And they looked at me and they grabbed my hands, opened their jackets and put them on their breasts. Armpits, breasts, somewhere in between. <laughs> Wasn't really constant. And I sort of fell into this chest and this other, other woman came behind me, opened her jacket and entombed me and they rocked me and they squeezed me. And I cried even more, but perhaps for other reasons. And, um, you know, so, but this is, you know, this is a very abstract situation. It's sort of a grown man sobbing on the top of a mountain, being hugged by two more Mongolian women. And then sort of five minutes later, semblance of feeling came back into my fingers. And again, this sort of autistic, narcissistic picture, picture, picture. And they're still standing there, the wind's blowing. They've got to go make the picture. Sort of waddled up to the camera and some form or other managed to stick the sheet in the camera. And I made the picture you just saw. Um, great. Wandering back down the mountain, it, it eventually sort of dawned on me what had really happened. If we get to the next picture, this is a few days later. Something magical has happened. And if you talk about making friendship, and if you talk about values, and you talk about making contact, I had spent three weeks on my knees worshipping these people. I'd spent three weeks idolizing these people. I'd spent three weeks saying, you are extraordinary, running around them in this sort of Mr. Bean-esque odd uh, way and what they decided was there I was failing on top of a mountain they decided to strip away all their cultural limitations now they're Muslims yeah now I spent a lot of my childhood living in the Islamic world and I'm sure some of you have visited there's one very strict rule first of all you don't look at any of the women if you can see them let alone be encouraged by the men to put your hands on their chests I think, okay, they're not fundamentalists, they're not ISIS in any way, but they do have certain protocol. And I think what had happened is they stripped all the protocol. They decided that this person needed help and he was a human being. And no matter what he was or where he was or what sex or race or religion or color, with or without hair, we needed to help him on this particular occasion. And so the lesson to me was the more you put yourself out there, the more vulnerable you become, the more emotional you become, the more bare, the more raw. In this strange journey that I'm trying to make these pictures, contacts and friendships came on a level that I'd really not ever dared to expect. So another very important question is I've made these pictures, you've made the book, been complimented, been criticized. But I think the one thing that matters to me is I need to reconnect with the people I took the pictures from. Um, this is a small making of, uh, of the Kazakhs. And I started to sort of talk online and, and I started being in, uh, invited by a number of production companies saying, OK, Jimmy, put your cake where your mouth is. We would like to take you back to these people. We would like to take you back on the journey. We would like to film you. And my wish was to give back the book, to give back the pictures, to show them what I'd taken, to start discussing with them what this is all about. Is it a fantasy? Is it romance? Is it iconography? Is there a deeper message? And most importantly, asking the people themselves, what do you want? How do you see yourself developing? The book is called Before They Pass Away. Now, nobody's going to die, but in my opinion, something will die. Something will be abandoned. And I wanted to discuss it with them. So one of the first journeys was back to the Cossack here. And then in a minute we go back on another journey. We go to um, another part of the world, uh, northern Namibia. And we go back to the, uh, the Himba. This is on the border of northern Namibia, on the border of uh, Angola. 
Um, it's another small film. And it, you know, we didn't arrive everywhere in a hot air balloon with sunrise every morning. This is a production value, but um, for the sake of television. But it's, it's an, a fantastic experience. You know, if you, again, you talk about values and friendship. You've taken something. You return back to these people. You find them. You, they see you. They, they all saw me. They all started crying because they said, many people have made films of us and taken our pictures before, but nobody, nobody has given us the respect to come back and give us what they took from them. We never understood what you were doing standing behind those tripods, film was. We didn't understand what it was all about. So you come back, you put yourself in front of them again, and then you start showing them the pictures that you made. And you have no idea of the tears and the emotion and the conversation and the respect that grew from that process. And then you start discussing, you start showing, they start recognizing themselves in the pictures. It's very, very exciting. You see their back straightening again, you see the pride, you see the chest coming out, and then eventually you come to the edge of a chapter, you, you finish with the himba, and then the himba turn a page, and they go to the tukshi. And then they see, wow, what's this? These people dressed in fur. What is fur? What's all that white stuff? Well, that is snow. And then you start explaining to them there are, are, are other groups, other pockets of the planet of indigenous cultures that do hold on to a very, very fantastic uh, traditional heritage. He's arriving back in the village and sort of showing them the book. And the thrill, it was, it was amazing. I've never, to be honest, I've never experienced something more uh, fulfilling than, you know, you know, amount of exhibitions or books or publications or compliments here, but to actually show the pictures you made of them and to see their reactions and to see their experience. That yeah, is great. And then I'm going to show you a few pictures. of one more story after this. It's very funny. Um, I went on another journey. A production company from CNN rang. And our guy said, hi, my name's Bob. Bob, are you Jimmy? And I said, yeah, I'm Jimmy. He said, we want to take you on a journey. I said, great, great. So he said, where would you like to go? So the compliment, you know, anywhere in the world. And I said, well, I'd love to go back here. I'd love to go back to Vanuatu. And, uh, and he goes, where's Vanuatu? And I said, well, it's somewhere in the Pacific, but it's spectacular. He said, well, we'll meet you in Sydney in two weeks' time. So in two weeks' time, I landed in Sydney. And there were six bobs all lined up. And they're all about 200 kilos. And they've all got eight boxes of drones. And I'm sort of saying, oh, no, what have I done? You know, this is not kind of the sort of experience I wanted to impose on the gentle Yakel in the island of Tana. And I thought, well, it is important that we have to make these films. We have to have these discussions. We have to communicate, not hide this whole story under the table. Talk about it. Discuss what's going to happen. So we arrived there, and the first thing was, you know, the, the Americans, well, Jesus, Jimmy, they're all naked. And I said, well, of course they are. You know, <laughs> film them, film them. So it took a few days to sort of, sort of park everybody and quieten them all down. Until towards the end, we got into this situation with the yakel under the tree. And I started making some more pictures. And it's fantastic, you know, in this sort of cathedral of a tree in this whole village. And then the chief said, come and sit with us. Come and sit with us. You are one of us, you know, in a sort of symbolic way. So there I was sitting with the tree. And I've got, you know, the six bobs filming and taking pictures. And then all of a sudden, the tree went very quiet, went completely silent. And I sort of looked around, and we heard this sort of a low humming, um, sort of humming of sort of discontent. And I thought, you know, there's something wrong. And, and the, the chief leant over to me, and he showed me the book, which I'd traveled with halfway across the world. And he goes, there's a problem. And I was going, oh, shit, you know, and I've done it now. You know, here I am, I'm miles away from anywhere. And, you know, it's, I'm in serious. And he says, there's a big, big problem. He said, you gave me a book. And I said, yeah, I gave you a book. And he said, yeah, um, but when is the rest of the village going to get their book? You promised us a book. So if anybody wants to come with me to Vanuatu sometime in the near future, I need a container of 80 books weighing 10 kilos of books. So I can't add one and one, but you can work out the weight of that. Um, so I think I have to go back again. Um, to conclude, so you have all these stories. You have all these adventures. You have all these friendships. And you have all these lessons. But What's it truly about? I spent a large part of the last five years traveling extensively. I also have my own tribe. They're here. This was a while ago. This is when they were small, and they listened to me. They, were, they, they thought I was amazing, and I put them on elephants and cactuses and, and paint them. And I photographed them in every which way I could. And in the last few months, things began to change. They, they all became teenagers. And uh, they became a bit bigger. And this is my son. Now, he's amazing, but he's 16. And he, he's an entity unto himself. I don't exist. And a few months ago, this is a true story, and I have to share with you this.
So, so, sweetie, I'm staying on holiday for a few weeks. And I said, staying on holiday? But I'm busy. I've got things to do. And she said, yeah, but, you know, it's a modern relationship. You've been finding yourself with the tribes. I'm going to find myself on a health retreat. I've got this yoga instructor, and uh, I need to reconnect. You go and reconnect with the kids, and I'll reconnect with myself and the yoga instructor. So that's a little bit awkward, but yeah, it's OK. I'm an adult, you know, uh, open relations. So it's, it, everything will be OK. So I sort of went home. And I got home, but my son has decided, you know, I don't understand him. I have no idea where he's coming from. And he disappeared. Three days into the city, no mobile, wasn't attending school. And I started to panic. And my youngest daughter came up to me. She said, Dad, are you OK? And I said, not really. She said, should we contact Mum? And I said, no, 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 don't come. I'm, I'm, I'm OK. She said, don't tell her yet, you know. And she said, you need to reconnect with uh, Narush. I said, I know, I know. She said, I've got a great idea. He told me the other day he wants to become a goth. Goth, goth, yeah, he wants black, his room in black, and he feels, you know. I said, why don't we take him to Ikea tonight? We can have a little bit of food, and then you can buy him some stuff, and maybe that's a way of finding contact. And I thought, good idea. So that night, we went to Ikea. My daughter found him. He got into the car, still with his headphones on and his hat over his eyes, wandering around Ikea. And within an hour, he came up to me, and I looked at him. I said, you know, is there? and he said, you know, you don't understand me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, it's too much color here. I want black. I said, black, 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 black. And he walked off into the shadows. So I, again, had this sort of moment as if you're sitting on a mountain in northern Mongolia with sort of frozen fingers and a moment of sort of semi-desperation. Is it time to ring mum? And uh, my youngest daughter came up and she said, Dad, it's OK, you know. You just let go. Look what I found. She came up to me with these sort of borstals and she said, do you remember when we were babies? We used to sit with you in the bath and we used to stick them on your bald head and hit them from side to side. <laughs> I said, yeah, but what on earth does that have to do with me? And she said, I stuck one on my head. And before I knew it, a whole load of kids came up and they all stuck these brushes on my head. If we can get to the next picture. <laughs> and I'm sitting there after a long day, just about to contact mum and interrupt her yoga session with a whole load of brushes on my head, somewhat upset. And then guess who comes out of the shadows? My son sort of came out of the shadows, took his hat off, took his headphones out, got his iPhone out, took a happy snap and walked past me back into the shadows. <laughs> Nothing happened. Three days later, just about to pick up the telephone to ring mum, Bang! The door goes downstairs in my study. And don't, 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 don't. he ran upstairs. And says, Dad, something's happened. Something's happened. Something's like, I started sweating. Shit, you know, Mum, she's not coming back. No, no, it's nothing to do with Mum. Look at my telephone. He sort of shoved his iPhone in my face. I said, I couldn't see it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, I've got one and a half million likes. I said, one and a half million likes? What, 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 what's this all about? He said, the other night in Ikea, when you stuck all those things on your head, well, I took a picture of it and I put it on nine gag. And I wrote underneath the perks of being bald and bored in Ikea. And I have one and a half million likes and letters from the whole world. And I was a little bit shocked, still not quite understanding the significance of social media. And he said, I have one thing to ask you, please, please. And this, remember, this is the first communication in weeks with him. He says, my whole class want to come to supper tomorrow night. And I said, why supper? He said, I've told them we're going to teach them how they can get as many likes online by posting things. Because we, we can do that. And I said, of course we can. Of course we can. So the next night, 30 kids sitting around the table, my son sitting next to me, arm over my shoulder. And I was indirectly teaching. And for the first time, I've remade contact with my son. And I think the, sort of the moral of the story being, you know, I've traveled around the world and I will carry on traveling and carry on communicating and trying to make contact in these pictures with people like Mark, cannibals under waterfalls. But don't ever forget the only way to keep everything in balance is to not remember the people that truly matter to you here. And the best way to keep in touch and keep in contact is a friendship of vulnerability and fallibility. So by putting yourself on the floor of a care on a very busy Thursday afternoon and inviting every child that walks past you to stick a brush on your head to end up looking like some Papua New Guinean tribesman is one of the best ways to stay in touch with your own self and your own family. Um, I leave you with one last picture. This is a, not one of my favorite pictures, um, but it's a picture of a nanette. And a colleague of mine said, Jimmy, if you do a present, you must show that picture of the nanette. And I said, but why? And she said, well, that's what this whole story is about. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, look in his eyes. And I began to study his eyes. And there's a very, very clear, sharp picture of me, if you look at it in detail, of me standing behind a tripod, flailing and wailing and shouting. She said, this, that's what this is about. You've etched yourself into their souls on your journey. So by perhaps using this picture as a symbol and a metaphor, I hope by having shared them with you, I've etched something in your souls. Now, I'm not going to be able to advise you on any financial planning in the near future, but I can show and share who these people are, what they mean to me and what they could mean to you, and how we can, can continue to keep respecting one another as human beings in our journey of communication. Thank you very much.